Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. It was an act of pure evil. The key right now is to determine the motive. The one thing we don't know yet is why. What could, whatever would, motivate someone to do something like this? At this point, authorities say they have not found a link. In the 1950s, America was considered to be a God-fearing nation. But when we stopped fearing God, we lost the restraint to take human life, whether it's from a hotel in Las Vegas or from the womb of an expectant mother. The Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And as long as we give God mere lip service, we will continue to do that which he considers to be evil. We'll continue to disregard his moral law. We will ignore the Ten Commandments, make up our own image of God, and then lie, steal, blaspheme his name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, be given to covetousness, and of course, take human life. May our preachers do their duty and go back to preaching that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. May we be faithful to preach that our God is holy and righteous, and may we uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ as the power that changes human hearts so that they depart from evil. Amen. Welcome, 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 welcome. You are listening to The Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk, and that was the voice of our brother, friend of the program, Ray Comfort. Where, where he left off is where I am going to pick up because in the, in the fallout following this horrendous travesty, uh, this 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 massacre that's a tragedy for for lots of families all across our country, and I would suggest which is a it is a tragedy for our nation as a whole. There's so many people, in my opinion, who are bypassing the true cause. I mean, lots lots of people say, "What is the motive? What is the motive?" And as that type of query is taking place, which I agree with, I want to get some information about it. There's still so much we don't know about the scenario that um, these type of conversations need to take place. But I would suggest that the conversations that are taking place, they, they are ignoring an even more important conversation that has to take place. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6, and, and Ray Comfort alluded to it. I'm going to read it now and, and talk a little bit about it. It says this very simply. And I'm reading from the ESV. It says, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. I'll, I'll read it again in the King James. It says this, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Now, I want to go back just a little bit because Jesus t has told us very candidly, very plainly, that his function, and I'm sorry, his purpose in establishing his church in the world was to be the pillar and ground of truth, to be salt and light. I've, I've discussed very, uh, in, in great detail, the function as salt and light. The church has a preservative function in maintaining uh, what we have inherited from the Lord and applying that to our culture, as well as the affirmative responsibility of invading darkness and lighting it up. And it also has, as the pillar and ground of truth, the responsibility of serving as the moral compass for a country, as the moral compass for a country. In times past, the church has played that role. But as the, the, the proverb that I just read said, by mercy and truth, we cannot afford to overdose on mercy and ignore truth. Because if we have one portion Without the other portion, iniquity will not be purged. It's amazing to me, and, and, and I understand the sentiment. It's amazing to me how many people, many of whom are purveyors of nothing less than absolute smut in our culture, that in times of great tragedy, 
They want to, to make statements like my, my prayers are sent to you and things of that nature. And my question is always, how can we add one way? The Bible tells us, you know, bitter water and sweet water can't come from the same spigot. How can we, for the overwhelming majority of our time, live in, in a posture where we fundamentally, we fundamentally reject and exclude the knowledge of God from our society? Yet we are surprised, we are surprised when people act in godless and depraved ways. The scripture says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. That fear, again, is not, you know, a trepidation, but it's a holy reverence. It is an awe-inspired reverence for the Lord. Paul, Apostle Paul said, uh, the love for the Lord constrains men. So what happens when men don't love Lord, love the Lord and no longer constrained? And I'm going to tie this all up because the third president, sorry, the second president of the United States, John Adams, said that the American constitutional republic is only fit for a holy and moral people. To say it differently, that the only way that a people can enjoy the freedoms of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The only way the people can self-govern is if the individuals in the nation are governed, are self-governed. The core of that self-government was this holy reverence for God. How can we reject God and exclude God from the entirety of our culture, yet expect men to conduct themselves in godly ways? It won't happen. It will not happen. We, we exclude God from our systems of, of education for our children. We, we are systematically removing God from every aspect, you know, of the entertainment we consume. We exclude God from the highways and byways of our society. We even in our secret sensitive movement, we want to exclude the, the truth of the cross from our churches. Yet we are amazed when men act in godless ways. How can we shudder and quake and in and, and, and shock when a man would massacre? To date, we know at least 59 people were killed in Las Vegas and, and over 500, nearly, or at least 527 people have been injured, maimed, um, hint, hint, hampered, hampered by a madman. And when I say madman, I don't mean that he's mentally insane. I mean mad in terms of being far afield from a baseline understanding of morality. <laughs> when we rip children out of the mother's wombs by the clip of thousands per day, thousands, how can, how can we then be surprised when we see that godlessness displayed from a 32nd floor in a Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas? What I'm saying for, what, what, what I am calling for, quite frankly, is for America's pulpits to once again return to the flame of righteousness that de Tocqueville acknowledged. When Alexis de Tocqueville toured America following the, the almost parallel American Revolution and French Revolution, and he saw that following the American Revolution, things were a lot different in America than things in France looked following that, that bloody, godless revolution that occurred there. De Tocqueville scoured the American systems, explored our banking, didn't find anything remarkable there, explored our education systems, didn't find anything remarkable there. Explored our political systems, find, found nothing of remarkability there. Yet he came to America's churches and he concluded this. He found America's churches and more specifically America's pulpits aflamed in righteousness. This is his words, not mine. You can check it out on On Democracy in America. Read it yourself. It's actually the same work that the concept of American except exceptionalism came from. It wasn't an American invention. De Tocqueville coined the, the phrase that we now understand as American exceptionalism, but he tied America's exceptionalism and he tied America's greatness following its, its revolution from England to America's pulpits being aflamed with righteousness. And he made this keen observation, America is great because she is good. Then he added what I would suggest is a prophetic warning to America. When America, should America cease to be good, America will cease to be great. Ladies and gentlemen, the observations 
that de Tocqueville made in the 1800s are being brought to bear today. George Washington in his farewell address at the time where he had all of the political favor of the entire nation, so much so where the American people wanted to make him king, George Washington says, we have not a king in America. The citizens of America are the source of the government's power. We don't have subjects in America. We have citizens. And in his farewell address, he said religion and morality. When he made that reference to religion, he was talking about Christianity. Religion and morality are indispensable supports. Now, if you're like me, you may come from an area where you have to look up the word indispensable. But when he said indispensable supports, He's, he's referring to those things that if this support is removed, the entire house crumbles. You know, in New Orleans, there are a lot of houses that are raised because New Orleans is below sea level. So because of the flooding, things of that nature, there are a lot of houses are on a raised foundation. Well, George Washington, General Washington, the first president was saying that religion and morality are indispensable supports of the American pu- Republic. In vain would that man claim the virtue of patriotism who would work to subvert either. Yet here we stand, literally at the the precipice of a 100 to 150 year onslaught, an onslaught, not not a a blitzkrieg revolution, but a revolution by evolution, a disciplined march through the systems where God is being eradicated in system by system. Remove the concept of God and and, and, and the, the, the freedom that is buttressed by a compassion from the financial system. What you end up with is predatory lending. Remove God from our educational systems. What you, what you end up with is knowledge that puffs up. Remove God from our judiciary. Remove God from our concept of politics. Remove God from all of these areas. What you're left with is the depraved human heart. And we cannot expect to go any further if we won't start at the beginning. I don't care what you have to say about gun control or the lack thereof. I don't care what you have to say about capitalism or conservative principles. If America does not return to the fear and the knowledge of the Lord, we will see this repeat over and over and over again. In our very Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Last year at Values Voters, I said, listen, the problem that we have in America is that we want to speed past this one nation under God. The very unity we desire, it is not the product of mere human ingenuity. It ain't going to happen. We want to have justice for all, but we want to skip over that, that hurdle that says under God. We have worked feverishly like a hamster on a wheel to excise God from everything that we know and that we can touch. Yet we want to now wring our hands in absolute um, shock when we have denied God and required his, his removal from everywhere else. And what happens? That God steps away. And when he does, when he does, I'm reminded that when David ran afoul of God, when uh, he, he, he numbered his military, And God gave him an option, whether or not he would be judged by his enemies or whether or not he would fall under the the wrath of God. And David cried out and said, oh, God, you please discipline me because men are wicked. Men are wicked. And I wouldn't be able to come back from what men would do to me. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you. Man that is unmoored from the fear of the Lord. Is a weapon of mass destruction. And we can say that we are tired of having these episodes, that we, we, we don't want to have any more of these instances where we have mass slaughter, mass chaos. And I am telling you that if we continue to pursue a society that systematically rejects the fear of the Lord, I hate to say this, but we'll be back here again. And so my call is that if the, the, your pastors listen to this program, Please don't shirk on preaching repentance. Please don't shirk on preaching holiness. Listen, strong medicine is strong medicine for a reason. But if we try to go to these other issues and we deny a fundamental knowledge and reverence for God, we're nipping around the periphery and not dealing with the root cause of the problem. Fear of the Lord causes men to depart from evil. Reverential fear for God causes men to depart from evil. The lack of the fear of God leads men to perpetrate dastardly, heinous actions upon their fellow man. 
you don't have to look any further than the systematic dismemberment of babies in the mother's womb to see exactly what I'm talking about. Not surprisingly, the after-school Satan Club has fizzled. Hi, I'm Matt Staver with Freedom's Call. Atheists masquerading as Satanists in Tacoma, Washington, are finding that their unique attempts to attack Christian after-school clubs are failing. In their effort to disrupt the Good News Club, the after-school Satan Club was founded. This club claims to counter evangelism in schools, but it is failing to entice members. It promotes evolution, gender confusion, and abortion. In contrast, the Good News Club teaches morals, character development, patriotism, and respect. The Satanist Club's ultimate agenda is eliminating after-school Christian clubs like those founded by Child Evangelism Fellowship. They know that if the after-school Satan Club is not permitted, legal precedents will cause Christian clubs to be banned as well. Liberty Council has offered free legal counsel to schools targeted by this disruptive group. Please pray and support good news clubs. Visit lc.org. Four years ago, on April the 5th, my daughter committed suicide. I was very angry, and I carried that anger through my grief for about the first 18 months. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I just happened upon this radio station. And I happened to be listening to a wonderful message. Uh, I think Dr. Jeremiah was the one that was preaching it. And it was about anger and how to release the anger. I felt like the Holy Spirit had literally taken me over. And I have not turned back since. I am no longer angry at my daughter for killing herself. Thank you for everything you do. Your partnership makes a difference. Join us during our three-day share starting October 17th. Listener supported American Family Radio for your family. Cross-examine. What is the most important skill you need to learn if you want your life to be a success into eternity? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the answer to that question is to properly interpret the Bible. That's the skill you need to have. Listen to Cross-Examine with Frank Turek, Saturday mornings at 9 Central and Sunday afternoons at 4 Central on American Family Radio. Friendships is an all-volunteer ministry helping the needy in the U.S. and abroad. There's an opportunity for you to care for Syrian war victims at Friendships Medical Field Clinic and Base in the Golan Heights. Among the positions available are doctors, nurses, dentists, interpreters, as well as personnel for operating the facility. For details, visit friendships.org or call 337-433-5022. Again, 337-433-5022. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, a number of other lawmakers who won't do anything about this because the NRA has their in a money clip also sent their thoughts and their prayers today, which uh, is, is good. They should be praying. They should be praying for God to forgive them for letting the gun lobby, lobby run this country. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. That was the voice of Jimmy Kimmel, who I thought was supposed to be a comedian, but I guess all of a sudden he's turned into a political Maharashi. Who knew? Who knew that when you become a celebrity, you go into a booth kind of like Clark Kent the Superman, and you become an all things to all men that you might win none? Sorry. I'll have more to say about him in a little bit. I'm excited uh, for this segment uh, because we have on the line, we have on the program with us, I'll go through his credentials, but I'll end with what I think is the most important part of his credentials. Uh, My brother in the faith, Eric Muldrow, who is a retired police officer with over 20 years of experience in law enforcement through a combination of both police work and corrections work. He retired from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, which is the exact same police department which is investigating the uh, massacre in Las Vegas uh, along with the FBI. He also served as a defensive tactics, firearm, and active shooter tactics instructor. And as a police officer, he also worked um, as a crisis intervention team officer, which addressed mentally ill 
suspects. He has experience in gang intelligence and gang response and also working surveillance and counterterrorism. Uh, Eric lives in the Las Vegas area now, and the most important part of his qualifications that I think will allow him to aid us in this conversation is that he is a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And him having a biblical worldview on top of this, the credentials that he carries, I believe qualifies him to speak to this in not, not only in a cogent and competent fashion, but in a way that could help you and I navigate these issues. Please welcome to the program my brother in the faith, Eric Muldrow. Hey, hey, how you doing, brother? Hey, man, I'm doing very well. Listen, I want to hop right into this, and I'll, I'll weave in some of the additional information that we're learning in this. But you being a veteran of law enforcement in Las Vegas, being on the ground there, uh, would you just, just share with our audience here a little bit of your initial uh, response to what's ha what has happened um, that has really uh, caused America to be shaken a bit? You know, I would have to say my initial response was I, I was surprised that it took this long for mm. something like this to take place. Uh, I worked. I was assigned to two areas, two primary areas I was assigned to as a, a patrol officer in Vegas was the known as the South Central Area Command and the Downtown Area Command. And those areas both encompass parts of their jurisdiction are different, at different sides uh, of the, uh, whether it's the north or south side of the Las Vegas Boulevard, which is uh, more popularly known as the Strip. Mm -hmm. And uh, just knowing the age, the day and age that we lived in, I was really surprised that it, I would constantly rehearse situations. Uh, you, know, you know, as an officer, you, you try to think of things before they take place, try to be proactive. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I would always try to rehearse situations in my mind from the simple things to the most extreme. Mm. And I would uh, always look at it and I wondered why, uh, yes, you know, in, in, uh, in when dealing with terrorism and, and military terms, you have what is known as like a hard or soft target. Mm -hmm. And I would always just say to myself, Vegas, the Las Vegas Boulevard, the Strip, was such a soft target. And I was just surprised that uh, we didn't have a, uh, a similar situation a lot sooner. But that was my first take on the whole thing. Okay, wow. And being that, and you are still in the area, you live in that area now, right? Yes, I do. What, what is the mood and the atmosphere in Las Vegas? I mean, I'm sure we can imagine it, but you being there, what, what I, I think would add some perspective to this. I, I've read some reports that said that even early this morning, the strip was a lot more quiet than it normally would be, even at, in, at 7 and 8 in the morning. So what is the mood and the atmosphere like there now? Well, I haven't been down on the Strip, but I have a lot of friends that are still uh, active uh, law enforcement officers, and uh, and just friends that work on that uh, work on the Strip in general. And I re I remember uh, talking to a uh, friend of mine yesterday, and he made the reference. He said it's like watching uh, I Am Legend with Will Smith, like when he was like mm -hmm. the la he thought he was like the last man on earth. It was like he said it was dead. There was like n you know no movement, no activity on the boulevard whatsoever. I would say the and which is in, if you know if you're familiar with uh, that being such a hot tourist spot, you would know how unusual that it would, it would be to see something like that. Yeah. But I think overall, when you're dealing with the mood, the general mood, everyone people are just really shocked. And it kind of falls in line with uh, uh, how in law enforcement, you know, you have this like old, you know, there's like, you have, it's like this old adage. And I think uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman makes reference to, and it's not a, to belittle anyone, but you have like the, you, the wolves, which he, he had the adage where like the wolf was the, the criminal. You have the, the sheep, which is the average everyday citizen, and you have the sheep dog, which is those are like the, your military and your law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it references how the the sheep, the sheep they go about their daily lives. And, and again, it's not meant to be a knock on anyone. They go about their daily lives, uh, and they and they interact. You know, they do the thing. They're, they're aware that the criminal element is out there, but they really don't. The average person doesn't normally have contact with them. Mm. And uh, and but then you have like the wolves who just their purpose is to prey on people, and that's what they do. And then you have the sheep dog who stands in the middle, in in line between the sheep and the wolf, and they 
thrive for, at moments like this. They, it's almost like they they look for moments like this. Yeah. So the average everyday citizen is really stunned and blown away by that. But most of the guys that I've been talking to, most of my uh, uh, cop friends, we all have the same mindset that, you know, either they the guys I know that were retired, they wish they were there helping out because I know that's how I felt. I wish I could throw the uniform back on for that for uh, for the uh, next week or so. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we saw it coming. But it's just it, overall, it's really just rock this city. The city is really reeling right now, and it's uh you know it's just a pretty somber mood overall. Now there's some additional information that's coming out, and obviously, uh, with with a situation like this. This more and more information will be will unfold. Um, yeah. There, there's some people who are not so sold on the fact uh, that's being pr- presented that it was a lone gunman. There are mm-hmm. issues, mm-hmm. you know, with uh, those presentations. And now there's some reports I even saw in some of the the, the Alphabet Super News networks are cur- covering it. The yeah. the gunman has pr- purported to set up a camera inside of his hotel room as well as one on the outside of the hotel room, the camera inside, uh, to yeah. record his dastardly attack on, on the strangers to him, and as well as cameras outside of the hotel room that would allow him to see approaching law enforcement. So my, my question is, here you have the, the media re- is reporting that this person who uh, acted alone in, in, in connected, and I'm not contesting that because I don't have enough facts to say yay or nay, but this is what's being pre- presented, who is just a retired uh, accountant and real estate investor who was relatively wealthy, 64 years old. Uh, but to me, I, I, would a, would a, in your experience with a civilian of that type of profile, if you will, have the type of experience that would allow him to carry that level of weaponry, that level of sophisticated planning and preparation into uh, what can only be described as a strategic location to execute yeah. this carnage, it, it just seems like this. It seems it doesn't make sense to me when when I consider. Okay, this is a banker who has this level of military and and I would say maybe type of firearm sophistication. Am I making sense? No, I agree. I, I mean, I think the uh, the thing that baffles me, and I don't want to get into just like you said. You know, and I'm in full agreement. You know, we can't say one way or another. We don't know. All all we can do is go uh, go by what we've been told, what we hear. Mm-hmm. But think, but some things just don't seem to add up right now. Um, what's the, you know, his like motivation? Where did he acquire these skills? I've had, uh, the the idea of location and having the the the, you know, the element of being on a uh, elevated platform as far as fire. I mean, there's some things the average citizen can go on, you know, the internet. And learn a array of talents and skills. Learn tactics. And, uh, learn how to modify their weapons to make them uh, fully automatic, from semi to fully automatic uh, bomb building. There's so many ways. I mean, we live in such an information age uh, that you can learn anything online. So, uh, is it feasible? Is it possible that he could self-educate himself to get to the point to where? He uh, acquires the skills necessary to pull the job. Yes, um, the likelihood of it, I, you know, I don't like. I said I don't want to speculate, mm-hmm. but in my mind, it things just don't add up. Yeah, I, I just really have a lot of problems just with this average everyday guy. I mean, like I said, the investigation is still going on. Right. We don't know what they'll find out. Was he radicalized? Uh, whether it be. Uh, Islamic terrorism, or whether it be some homegrown, uh, uh, possibly a supremacist group, or mm-hmm. whether it would be like a uh, a sovereign citizen type group, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Right now, there's just so many questions, and because normally at this stage in an investigation, when we look at other shootings, we have some type of a motive, some degree of a motive. But right now, this there's still so much darkness. There's still so much that we don't know. Yeah, and, 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 and that's I, a difficult part. Yeah, and I made that my, my I posed my question, the rambling question, in light of the fact that okay, if, he has, if there's camera set up, then that means there's video somewhere. Well, what's up with the video? And then you have mm. the, the other information leaking that <laughs> it appears that the the person who's been named as the gunman transferred a hundred thousand dollars to the Philippines, which yeah, is where yeah, his yeah. his living girlfriend is from. 
which again, and I said this yesterday, there's some there there are reports and ISIS even doubled down in saying that they, they, they are claiming responsibility for the attack, but the FBI has said there's no evidence to support that. You know, but then you have now we're learning about him sending money to the Philippines where it is a fact that ISIS has a very heavy presence in the Philippines, which is where his girlfriend is from. Uh, <laughs> what do we do with this factual inf- – what do we do with these facts and information? And, and I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I want to get to the evangelism first. But, again, this type of information, it, it's, 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 it's seemingly inconsistent. But I started off the program referring to Proverbs 16.6 and discussing that it is the fear of the Lord that causes men, drives men – to depart from evil, and you yeah. are engaged there in Vegas in something that I would suggest is the proper, I would say, proceeding to this incident and absolutely the proper response to it where you are doing some street evangelism there in Vegas. Would you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yes. Yes, I am. Are yeah, you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. And, and one of the things, I saw you post about this in social media, and I mentioned it here on the show before, where you said that what is this – and I'm paraphrasing, and you correct me if I get it wrong, you said, what state are we in as a country when you go out to evangelize and you immediately get misconstrued for either a Jehovah's Witness or a, a Mormon? Mm, mm. When you posted that, I had to tell you that struck me, and it resonated with me deeply. Yeah, it, I would, uh, it, it resonated with me, and it, uh, it really saddened me. I dealt with some old brothers uh, that... I used to do ministry with, whether at one of my old churches where we were in small groups. And then there's another brother who was uh, another fellow officer, and uh, and he's very active in um, doing some – he has a nonprofit where he does some uh, ministry also within uh, the Vegas Valley. Mm-hmm. And when we got back, it, it's it, this is something that the Lord – I truly believe that uh, – uh, witnessing and evangelism is something that the Lord has truly placed on my heart. Mm. Even at times where my walk with the Lord, in their time, I would say that uh, not to get deep into my testimony, but for a long time, I uh, I was a prime example of someone who professed the Lord with my mouth, but my heart was far from him. Mm. And uh, even during those periods, the, there was a, a passion in me to defend the faith. Mm. Uh, and I would, uh, when I worked at the prison, when I used to work at a prison back in Indiana, I used to have, and that was a real, it was a, it was a, it was a blessing in many ways because you have a lot of guys in there who have nothing to do but sit around and study and read. So they would challenge me on my beliefs, mm. and I had never been taught uh, apologet, apologetics in my life, mm. so I had no response whatsoever. So it forced me to to start looking, and we didn't. And at that time, we're talking about uh, early '90s, like '92, '93, '94. Mm-hmm. We didn't have the, uh, the the luxury of uh, the internet, so mm-hmm. I had to just go on a hunt and try to find different books and things like that, and dealing with apologetics. So it put me in a place to where I had to learn the answers, like the reasons of why do I believe what I believe? Am I just going based on what my parents taught me, or is there some is there truth? to what it is that we proclaim and what makes us different from any other belief system. And I know I'm going a little round, so uh, you have to forgive me on that. No, no, you, as, you're going right, right as where a, I, wanted, I wanted to talk. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah, but as the, as the, so through the years, and this is even when I was professing faith in the Lord, I was learning how to defend him, as crazy as that may sound. But it wasn't until, uh, I would say, a good seven, eight years ago where the Lord were in I was really blessed a few uh, weeks back when you had Ray Comfort on Mm -hmm. because his ministry, uh, Living Waters, and his television program, The Way of the Master, the Lord used that to bring me to the place to where I finally saw myself as a truly sinful man Mm -hmm. who was an enemy of God because I bore no fruit. I, I bore, instead of the fruits of the Spirit, my life exemplified the works of the flesh. And through his his through that television show that I was intrigued by because they would show him doing street ministry. Twenty the seconds. Lord used it. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry, I said twenty seconds. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, the Lord used that to uh, radically change my heart and wake me up to the point of where I had to fall down on my knees and repent and truly repent of my sin. And I would say since then I haven't been the same since. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our brother in the faith, Eric Muldrow, sharing, which I think where we really need to come to rest on this issue, the necessity of evangelism, but evangelism based in an understanding of apologetics and a biblical worldview. Here for your encouragement and your walk with God, this is David Wolin with Haven Ministries inviting you to anchor your day in God's Word. Is it possible for condescending to be a good thing? Usually, if someone says you're being condescending, it means there's a problem with your words or your attitude, right? Your actions are implying to others that you think you're bigger or better or above somebody else. But you know what? Condescending isn't always bad. When a grown-up speaks to a small child, they nearly always condescend. That is, they come down and speak at the child's level, which is both appropriate and considerate. And it's something that God did by becoming a man. Jesus condescended when, as Philippians 2 puts it, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Get daily encouragement with Anchor Devotional. Visit GetAnchor.com. Hi everyone, Carl Kirby with Reasons for Hope, talking about one of God's most amazing super creatures, the giraffe. Did you know that giraffes move both legs together on the same side of the body when they walk? But when they run, they swing their rear and front legs in unison. They can also go longer without drinking water than a camel. They only need to drink once every few days because they get most of their water from the plants that they eat. When modern man first studied the giraffe from a technical perspective, they gave them the scientific name Giraffa camelopardalis, because it was thought to be the evolutionary combination of a leopard and a camel. Talk about a major gaffe with a giraffe. Get it? Fact is, all of the unique features that we see in giraffes are not benign and beneficial accidents of natural selection, but rather they have been delightfully designed by a super creative, intelligent, purposeful, and loving God. The heavens truly declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. For more information, check us out at rforh.com. Hello, Americans. I'm Todd Starnes with news and commentary next. If Las Vegas police know the motive in Sunday night's massacre, they are not telling us, at least not now. There are many missing puzzle pieces, but in the meantime, Hollywood and the mainstream media and a good many Democrats have already assigned blame. Hillary Clinton said the National Rifle Association bears responsibility. Comedian Michael Ian Black called the NRA a terrorist organization. Meanwhile, Senator Elizabeth Warren says it's time to crack down on gun ownership. And the CBS vice president said she had no sympathy for the victims because country music fans are more often than not Republican gun toters. She was later fired. It's troubling to hear that kind of talk after a national tragedy, but that's where we are as a country. Instead of giving people time to heal their wounds and bury the dead, the politicians and pundits are trying to score cheap political points. Truth is, Las Vegas does not need politics. They need prayers. I'm Todd Starnes. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net and UrbanFamilyTalk.com. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Is there a government solution to every human problem? I would say no. And I I think we also should think about what we do on a daily basis as, as individuals to each other. I also think we should remember that we've done a lot to kick... Christianity, God, to the curb in our society, in the way we treat each other, in some government policy, in our schools. We can talk a lot about climate change and all these wonderful things in school, but we can't say a simple prayer or even have a a moment of silence in a lot of schools today. That's 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 just not good. We we have to get back to the basics in human society, and and I think our country is is hurting in a lot of ways. And and people on the left are, are upset. People on the right are upset. You have to understand there is not a government solution for every problem. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people on the left are like, oh, if we only did this, background checks, he would have passed a background check. Oh, if we only uh, outlawed machine guns, guess what? They're outlawed except for grandfathered machine guns, very difficult to get. So that wouldn't have helped. And when pressed, a lot of these congressmen, I saw them on other networks this morning, they were stumbling. Okay, what specifically would have stopped this? They actually have no constitutional answer. You. That was the voice of Laura Ingram doing a couple things. One carrying the point that I, that I was making earlier. Listen, how long can we ad- intentionally exclude God from our society yet uh, want to have the results of a God-honoring 
society. It, it, the two don't, don't work together. And then the immediate turn to gun control, <laughs> I mean, it, it's laughable. Uh, the, the normal references, and let, let me just say this, we're going to open the phone lines this uh, segment. The number is 888-589-8840. The number again is 888-589-8840. Uh, because we're going to open the phone lines to have conversations about everything we discuss uh, during this program. The fear of the Lord being the impetus for men turning away from evil. And as I said before, there's just a lot of things about this, and we don't have all the facts to this shooting in Las Vegas, but there's just a lot of things, a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up. And there's some things that just don't sit well with this incident. So if you want to be a part of the program, you're welcome to call uh, to have a conversation with me about anything we've discussed so far. But Laura Ingram, uh, in the clip that I played just now, she she immediately said, you know, some of the top tier discussions from the uh, the, the regressives in the gun control world, background, comprehensive background checks. Well, this guy would have passed all those background checks. You know, well, what about, you know, machine guns, automatic weapons, Psh, banned in 1986. <laughs> you know, and, and you, you had Hillary Clinton very ignorantly referring to silencers which showed her ignorance is weighing in on the situation to where she had to be corrected publicly. They said, well, listen, they're called suppressors, not silencers, because even with the suppressors, the machine gun of the caliber and, and, and the, the type, uh, a gun, not machine gun, but the gun type that was purported to use in this incident would have sounded like a jackhammer. So she didn't even know what she's talking about. And, and I alluded earlier into the program, it's, about, it's amazing to me how these, you, these celebrities uh, misconstrue their celebrity with a self-appointment to expert, you know, a field expert. In trial, you know, when we, had, we wanted to put on expert testimony of a sort in, in, in cases, in court, you had to go through this process called qualifying the witness, in which the opposing party, we had the opportunity to voir dire the qualifications of your purported witness. Well, you know, these people, who, are, who anointed them? Witnesses. You know, you had Jimmy Kimmel, who first was, you know, an expert on health care which it came out that he really was using the talking points from the Democrat Party. And so now he's morphed himself yet again, moving on from being an expert in uh, health care. And now he's an expert on, you know, quote unquote, gun violence. And every time I hear the phrase gun violence, every time I hear the phrase gun violence, I think, man, you know, did, did, am I in the twilight zone? Do guns just wake up in the morning and, 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 and align themselves up and go out and shoot at themselves? Of course not. Of course not. I heard my, my good friend uh, Stacy Washington from Stacy on the Right on Urban Family. She said, listen, people who are overweight, you don't see us uh, condemning spoons, you know, and say, well, you know, I've gained 10 pounds. So oh, that spoon, it really spoon violence. You know, saying that we're going to act like we don't have depraved human beings. I, I talked before when my show was on Urban before coming to AFR um, up in, in, in Europe where there was a terrorist attack committed with vans. And the reporter in Europe said, you know, we really ought to ban auto be automobiles. And I'm thinking, does she not realize the insanity of her opinion? Ign ignore, ignore the, ignore the fact <laughs> that there's a person driving an automobile. It's the automobile that's killing people. You know, it's just, it's insane. It's insane. And the actuality, what we really need to come and to confront head on, is that it is a fear of the Lord, the holy reverence for the Lord that, that, that drives men to depart from evil. And unless we come to terms with that, we won't move forward at all. But as promised, we'll go to the phone lines again. And if you want to join the program, you are welcome to call. The number to call in and to go on to the radio live with me is 888-589-8840. Once again, that number is 888 888- Five eight nine eight eight four zero. We'll go first to Alabama, where we have Jacob on the line. Jacob, welcome to the Hamilton Corner. How are you doing, my brother? I'm doing very well under the circumstances, but I have to tell you, my heart is heavy for our country. Well, we're we're gonna, we're gonna pray for you to get over the circumstances, so that you are always above them. Because you got to realize this is the devil now, and the devil will work through whoever he can. Because that particular guy that did the shooting. He had a pilot's license. Mm -hmm. He used to manage a, a uh, apartment complex. Mm -hmm. He's got so much for him, you know, that it shows that this is not why he was doing this. There's more to it. 
But at the same time, we have to realize that guys like Kimball and them, they have a platform, but they have no wisdom and no understanding mm. that they're speaking. They're just talking heads. Same thing with the media. Unless they stay in the Word of God and they, and they respect the Lord for who he is, they have no solution whatsoever. They'll be shooting all over the place trying to get a solution to this, and it's not gun control. Yeah. You see? Yeah. It's the, the fact that they have told the Lord, I'm kicking you out every place, and the Lord didn't say, okay, I'm going to get back at you. This No, he said, being you did this, I have to allow these things to bring you back to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for your call. Thank you for your comments. Uh, again, if you want to join the program, the number is 888-589-8840, 888-589-8840. Well, I found it interesting that the person who has been uh, accused as the gunman, his father, was known to criminality. Uh, his father, Benjamin Paddock, uh, was arrested and incarcerated in 1960 for robbing a, a, an Arizona bank, but he escaped from federal prison and was on the run from the, from, the fe, from the federal law enforcement for years, which landed him on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, the, at the time, Palmer Bacon Jr., who was the FBI agent in charge of the Phoenix FBI office, regarded Benjamin Paddock in this way, saying, quote, since he has utilized firearms in previous crimes, has employed violence in attempting to evade arrest, and has been diagnosed as being psychopathic, Paddock should be considered extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. And again, some other information that I came across, the, this is just again, information to, to share it in, in preparing for the program that I found what appeared to be the alleged shooter Paddock at, a, at an anti-Trump rally with one of the pink hats on his head that the women were wearing at the Women's March. And so... I'm saying that, okay, is this paddock or is this not paddock? Where it's kind of like the, 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 you know, the alphabet soup of networks don't want to confirm or deny. And I'm saying, well, is this guy, and I agree with Jacob, that to ignore the fact that Satan walks about as a royal lion seeking whom he may devour, and he will use whomever he, whoever will be allowed to use, whoever would allow him to use them to perpetrate evil, but I'm saying I, I, I'm wondering, considering the fact, as the vice president of CBS pointed out, that lots of Trump supporters attend country concerts. Is it that the media knows this information and they're concealing it? Or what's, what's really happening here? That if it turns out that this guy was an anti-Trump uh, hater who just wanted to take out people who he perceived as Trump supporters, if they know that information, why would they conceal that information? I think you already know the answer. But back to the phone lines, we'll go next to Tennessee, where we have Dalton calling from Tennessee. Dalton, welcome to the Hamilton Corner. Thank you, sir. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dalton. Uh, uh, so, so far as the guy in the in the uh, video at the anti-Trump thing, uh huh. I mean, it, it is pretty grainy, but it, it looks like him to me. Surely somebody that was there with them would know or uh, I would think some sort of law enforcement that was monitoring that would know if that really was him and that girl that that alleged uh, in the video saying that uh, somebody came up and told the people up by the stage that they were all going to die right uh where is she sure somebody <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah, where's she? Yeah, where's Who's she? Talking to her. Yeah, yeah. And who who has the most who has the most to gain out of this whole thing? I'm just I'm just speculating. Right. But it seems to me like it seems to me like the left and the anti gun forces have the most. That's the way it, it appears so far, Dalton. Thank you so much for your call and, and your comments. You're exactly right. You know, there were some witnesses at the concert who reported that. And listen, I don't know. This is all information I <laughs> that. Is being shared that some of the witnesses said there was a, there was a young lady who came into the crowd about thirty to forty minutes before the shooting uh, took place began saying that oh you're all gonna die and I'm saying where is where is this coming from where is this coming from and again there are people who are reporting and ISIS has claimed responsibility for this attack 
claiming that they have radicalized the purported shooter. And the FBI has came out and squashed that, saying that there's no evidence of that. Would it be inappropriate for the FBI to tell us, the American public, why they have come to that conclusion? You know, on what basis have they concluded there's no connection? These are just questions that, that are roving, rolling around lots of our minds as this thing unfolds. But back to Tennessee with the, on the phone lines where we have Kevin calling from Tennessee. Kevin, welcome to the Hamilton Corner. Greetings, my brother. Uh, the shooter in in uh, Antioch over there by Nashville? Yes, yes. Where Caleb uh, Ingle stepped in to stop him at the church there? Right. Yeah. Uh, he he had been, uh, they're, they're not sure if it was like a vacation Bible school that he had participated in. Uh, he wanted to be a pastor or a psychiatrist. Two years, uh, apparently... He was studying psychiatry. Not his last tweet, but two or three tweets, uh, either the, the one before the, his last tweet or the uh, one before that. He tweeted, everything that we have been told is a lie, is truth, and everything that we have been told is truth, is a lie. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's the way I heard it. So he apparently went and studied psychology for psychiatry for two years and became insane. <laughs> Which wouldn't be surprising. How, how does that tie into this incident in, in Vegas? Well, that guy, was, was he indoctrinated by, you know, uh, you know, he spent a lot of time in hotel rooms and away from people. Who was his friends? What were they telling him? How was how was he informed? Yeah. Yeah. These are questions. Thank you, Kevin, for your call and, and your questions. These are questions that I would imagine that law enforcement has, whether or not they're asking them. I would hope that they are. Um, but this uh, is it's just. The incident in and of itself is enough to be unnerving. But when you add in how much apparent fog around the motivations here, it's just interesting. But back to the phone lines. This, this will be the last call we'll get to for today. Uh, in Arkansas, we have Ron on the line. Ron, welcome to the Hamilton Corner. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It's good to hear you again. Um, I'm just curious as why do the media make, make such a slam dunk decisions on stuff like, oh, well, he's not a, he's not a Muslim terrorist or whatever. Right. He has no affili- affiliation to Muslims. Right. That's a great question, Ron, <laughs> because <laughs> I haven't made that that slam dunk affirmative declaration. I think the only thing that can be said is either we don't know or we don't think so. And if they're going to say in this day and age, if they are going to say that there aren't any connections, wouldn't it be nice if they would tell us how they come to that conclusion? You know, because we have ISIS claiming responsibility. But the FBI saying, no, there's no Muslim connection here. And listen, again, I'm not saying that there is. But I'm saying that if there isn't, and they know that there isn't, I think it would be nice for the American people to know why they were able to come to that conclusion. You know, there's a lot going on here. But the ultimate conclusion to the matter is, I believe, the way that we started the program. The only way out of this quagmire is if America falls her, finds her way to her knees before it's too late. The reason why I say it before it's too late, because the Bible tells us very plainly, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Not most, not some, not those that are with the, you know, the right-wing majority or the right-wing minority, not those who are a part of the regressive left. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess his Lord. The question is, will you do so in reverence or in judgment? Eat. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. Faith, family, freedom. American Family Radio. We desperately need a spiritual awakening. Situations have deteriorated to the point where the only thing that will save us is for God to step in in revival. 
Revive Us Again is a powerful new DVD from the AFA Cultural Institute featuring David Butts of Harvest Prayer Ministries. I believe that the only hope for America is revival. Available at afastore.net. Faith, family, freedom. American Family Radio, a ministry of the American Family Association. This is American Family News. I'm Steve Jordahl. Documents obtained by Judicial Watch reveal the IRS was involved in a $5 million campaign to pressure Americans into buying Obamacare plans. Letters of different types were sent to people that chose not to enroll in a plan and to pay tax penalties, or they received a temporary exemption. Damian Brady of the National Taxpayer Union Foundation says that could be intimidating. Well, on the one hand, they're, they're doing a favor for some people who are going to face potentially a penalty for not um, signing up for Obamacare. But on the other hand, it, you're going to get this letter also if you had previously claimed a, and received a valid exemption from Obamacare. So in that case, is in that case, it could be rather intimidating to open up his letter and see that you could be facing penalties in the next year. As for the $5 million price tag, Brady says it seems high for a project to send out letters to people that might have cost about $10,000 at most. More heroes from the Las Vegas massacre. Twelve off-duty firefighters were shot while attending a country music festival in Las Vegas, including two who were wounded while administrating CPR to gunshot victims. All of the firefighters survived. Congress has yet to move on a bill vital to medical professionals. Details from AFN's Charlie Butts. Doctors, nurses, and pharmacists are in a quandary as to what they can and cannot do based on their conscience or religious beliefs, because after all, they were in the profession to heal and not kill. Two primary areas of concern are abortion and assisted suicide. RN Nancy Valco, spokeswoman for the National Association of Pro-Life Nurses, tells AFN they are even targeted within their own profession. Just recently, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, who was one of the principal architects of Obamacare and highly respected, came out and said there shouldn't be conscience rights. They should be forbidden when an action is considered professionally accepted and appropriate medical intervention. Meaning doctors and nurses who object to abortion or assisted suicide must take part in it if it's legal, no exception for people of faith. These are the kind of cases that people don't hear about and why it's so important, not just for us, but for society, the healthcare profession, and society at large, that conscience rights be protected, particularly since we're under an assault from so many different angles with the end of life as well as with abortion. Then there's the Obama-era dictate that health professionals have to participate in transgender transition therapy and surgery regardless of their beliefs. The Conscience Act of 2017 would correct that, but it's still lingering in Congress. I'm Charlie Butts. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has taken steps to reverse the Obama-era guidelines which denied college students accused of rape and sexual assault legal due process. AFN's Bob Kellogg reports. Hans von Spakovsky of the Heritage Foundation, in an article for the Daily Signal, writes that the Obama administration drove colleges to implement star chamber-like tribunals to mishandle sexual assault cases. Those not following the guidelines risked losing federal funds. Universities uh, told students that uh, they couldn't ask questions of their accuser. They couldn't be represented by lawyers. They couldn't get uh, a look at all the evidence against them. The tribunals on campus often were secret. He says by rolling back the federal guidelines, pressure is taken off college and university officials who are ill-equipped to handle serious legal cases. These campus tribunals were made up of professors and others with absolutely no experience of any kind in investigating criminal violations of the law. They had no idea how to look at evidence, how to question people. They made all kinds of mistakes. I'm Bob Kellogg. And finally, the North Carolina State Fair has come out with its menu. It begins on October 12th and will offer a Thanksgiving egg roll with turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and cranberry sauce inside a wonton wrapper. Or maybe you prefer deep-fried pumpkin pie. How about roasted corn on the cob coated with mayonnaise and flaming hot Cheetos? You can get deep-fried bacon, and if North Carolina is like other states, you can probably get deep-fried Twinkies. Some fairs are even offering deep-fried butter. Look it up. For American Family News, I'm Steve Jordahl. Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve answers life's biggest question. 
You say, well, Jeff, I don't understand because some of these smart people, you go to the the universities in Oxford and Stanford and places like that, and it seems like in their their science department, all those guys are uh, evolutionists. And and so many of the, the professors, they don't believe in God, and they're so smart. So if the smart, smart people don't believe in God, maybe I shouldn't believe in God either. It seems like the dumb people believe in God, and the smart people don't believe in God. That's not true. There's some dumb people that don't believe in God. There's some smart people that do believe in God. Has nothing to do with a person's intellect. Listen, those that don't believe in God, those who reject God, they are morally wicked. They don't have a head problem, they have a heart problem, and they love their sin. Men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. He can heal every scar. Since the beginning of time, people have been asking big questions about life. And the question of all questions is this, does God really exist? And when people answer that question wrong, it skews their view of life. It turns them cynical and eventually leaves them hopeless. This is the Tuesday edition of From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new series called Life's Big Questions, a series of six messages that addresses the six most profound questions that we can ask. And today's is a giant. Now, we began this lesson last time, and we'll do some catching up today. But if you missed yesterday's broadcast, you can listen again anytime online at fromhisheart.org. There, too, you can download a free MP3 of any broadcast to share with your friend. Let's get started on one of life's biggest questions. Open your Bible to the book of Genesis. Now, here's Pastor Jeff to definitively answer the question, does God really exist? You know, for thousands of years, people have been asking questions, big questions concerning origins, concerning purpose, concerning meaning, concerning the whys and wherefores of life. And God's Word gives us answers to the big, big questions. So we want to tackle this great question because it's such a fundamental question, such a foundational question. Does God really exist? Now, I want you to notice with me three discoveries concerning the question, does God really exist? Discovery number one, the Bible doesn't try to prove God. It simply presents God. Simply presents God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Scripture doesn't try and argue for God's existence. Scripture doesn't try and defend God's existence. It doesn't try to explain God's existence. It just presents God in the beginning God. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible presents him right off the bat as a God who is eternal. And then he's also presented as the all-powerful creator. You have to have a tremendous amount of power, an unfathomable amount of power to step into nothing and speak everything into existence just through the power of your word. That's how God did it. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Everything obeys God because God is the all-powerful creator. And that's how the Bible presents him. Doesn't prove him, just presents him. In the beginning, God. Now, second discovery. Not only does the Bible not try to prove God, it just simply presents God, but secondly, the Bible gives evidence for the existence of God. You know, you can't, you can't really prove God, but you can look at the evidence and determine with a rational mind whether there is a God or not, whether God exists or not, depending upon the evidence. Romans chapter 1 talks about the evidence. And it says this in verse 18 and following, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They hold back the truth and unrighteousness. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident. 